<laughs> All right, uh, I want to say a few more words about the healing of the man, deaf, and uh, with the speech impediment, and then move into the uh, uh, the very next thing, which is uh, the feeding of the 4,000 in chapter 8. So we're in the tail end of Mark chapter 7, and let's open with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to study your word. As we meditate on all that you have to say to us, may it strengthen our faith in your son, Jesus, and help us to grow in grace and godliness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So at the end of seven, where you have the, the, the healing of the man who's deaf and has a speech impediment, remember that we're in the, the Gentile region. Of, of the Decapolis. And so we're, we're somewhere here west of the Sea of, I mean, east of the Sea of Galilee, uh, probably maybe even a little south. Um, but, but this is Gentile territory. Um, that he heals this man that we're told uh, does not speak well. And what might we? Anybody have two yardsticks? That's what I do at home. Children pass by me. Throw myself against the wall. No. Uh, heard someone say the other day, you know, I love my son, but if I thought he was going to sneeze on me, I would shoot him in the gut. <laughs> <laughs> That's what COVID's done to us all. Um, the, uh, the, the the little detail about him not speaking well, what does that imply about his deafness? From birth. From birth. Yeah. See, he, he, it's, it's not like he had the had hearing and lost it at some point, but that he never had it. And so he's unable ever to speak clearly because he's, he's never actually heard how to, to speak um, uh, correctly. And that makes it all the more remarkable, doesn't it, that there, there's no uh, there, there's, there's no therapy, <laughs> there's no rehab for this guy after Jesus not only opens his ears, but also causes his tongue now to speak how? Clearly. Uh, it, it says uh, his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then and there. And I, I think there's a wonderful analogy in this, a, a picture of what it is for us to be converted, to be brought to faith. Uh, you know, you, maybe maybe a perfect example of this would be, would be Saul, uh, the Apostle Paul, that when he's converted, right, I mean, he immediately starts preaching Christ. You know, there, there's no going to seminary for him. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this man who was a persecutor of the church and the Christians and of Christ himself, uh, he immediately upon being brought to faith in the risen Jesus, has a new language, speaks clearly. Um, you know, there's, there's no having to, to go on for a while and, and put all the pieces together. He immediately has this new language of faith. And so it is for us. And, and that, that's symbolized even in the infant's baptism where, where we speak on the child's behalf the words of the Apostles' Creed, but from the beginning, as, as, as saved children of God, we have words to speak. We have a language, as it were. We go from a language opposed to God, the language of the devil, the kingdom of darkness, to being able to, to, to speak clearly uh, the, the wonders of Christ. And, and so uh, there's that. It, it's interesting... Uh, the second thing I wanted to bring out is this Ambrose, St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, uh, mentor to St. Augustine. Uh, I love Ambrose. Ambrose is the guy that gave us, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ambrose is responsible for, it is, is credited with uh, more or less the words of the Te Deum, for example. Um, 
Ambrose is uh, is writing here a, a work called On the Mysteries, which we might uh, translate it concerning the sacraments. That's what he has in mind. Um, but he speaks of baptism here, and he says uh, this, Open then your ears, inhale the good savor of eternal life, which has been breathed upon you by the grace of the sacraments, which was signified to you by us when, celebrating the mystery of the opening, talks about the mystery of the opening, we said Ephatha, which is, be opened, that whosoever was coming in quest of peace might know what he was asked and be bound to remember what he answered. So we, we get a glimpse into how the, the earliest practice of baptizing went. And apparently it included this, just as we, what, what do we do when we have a baptism in church? One of, the, one of the preliminary things is we make the sign of the cross both upon the forehead and upon the heart. And apparently very early on, part of the baptismal rite included saying the words Ephatha. From, from this account of the healing of the, the deaf man. Be open that, that this became symbolic of what happens when one is baptized. One now is opened to life with God. Is, is that, at the time of Ambrose, in that time period, were there still only two sacraments then? Oh, yeah, that, it depends on who you read. You, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't get fixed that idea that there are seven uh -huh. until sometime in the Middle Ages. You know, by, by the time you get to Aquinas, we, we're we're operating with this seven idea of, of, of sacraments. But but early earlier on, it's it, it depends on on who you read uh -huh. and and depending on how they're using the word. So for example, Ambrose he's using the word mysteries, uh, and mystery gets taken taken over and by the Latin with the word with the word sacrament. Uh, but but even so it's it's not yeah it's, it's by no means a fixed thing that the number of sacraments and a lot depends. But let me just say this about that. And I, I, we're moving in already on Saturday mornings in the adult instruction class to discussing the sacraments, uh, starting with baptism. And you know I have this whole thing about okay it's it's a placeholder, that word sacrament. We're not using the word sacrament the way the Bible uses. I mean, the Bible is written in Latin. It's a Latin word, but it doesn't even use the word mystery the way the later church uses the word mystery as a term exclusively for what we would call the sacraments. When Paul talks about the mystery or the mysteries of God, he's referring to the whole thing, the gospel. You know, what, what, what's, what mystery has now been revealed the mystery that God loves the world through his son Christ. That's the mystery. It's not a specific term for something such as baptism and Lord's Supper. Right? But, but that word gets, over time, used now to be kind of jargon, a theological placeholder for something that the Bible does talk about, namely a rite instituted by Christ himself that involves a visible element and which gives the forgiveness of sins. And so what meets that definition, baptism does, or supper does, absolution almost does, because certainly Christ commands us to forgive sins, to speak the words of forgiveness, but we don't have a visible element in all. Well, that one hymn that we sing, sometimes in place of the Tadeum, that's the traditional Tadeum. Yeah, yeah. We sing that one hymn in the closing uh, line is, while we own the mystery. Yeah, 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 okay. I don't think the yeah, own the mysteries is not their own the sacraments, but mysteries the way Paul uses the word. That's right, that's right. Yeah, and, and obviously, I mean, Ambrose is going to recognize that Paul isn't using mystery the same way he's using mystery to apply to the sacrament, right? Okay, but but here's, here's the other thing to say about that, that for teaching purposes, it's nice to have this shorthand with, with a word like sacrament. But one thing that that does, unfortunately, is we lose the peculiarity of each. I mean, the Bible doesn't talk about the category sacrament and then proceed to say, one of them's baptism, one of them's Lord's Supper. Instead, it 
talks about baptism, and it talks about the Lord's Supper. And so the distinctions between the two get brought out that way, that they are similar in some ways, but they're also quite different. And, and, and that's one thing that by going back over the church's history and recognizing that this was kind of, a, you know, they, they, it's loose. You know, it's not, it's not as systematic as we make it sound in confirmation class. And, and, and there's value in that because the Bible presents it with a little more nuance and distinctiveness than we sometimes end up doing in a, in a, in a Bible class. Right, that, that baptism, we, there's a lot to say about baptism that doesn't apply to the Lord's Supper. There's a lot to say about the Lord's Supper that doesn't apply to baptism. But if we say, oh, they're, they're all sacraments, I got, got it, it's through by Christ, visible element, gives forgiveness of sins, got it. No, 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 there's much more to, to learn and, and meditate on and, and to, uh, to draw comfort from in the what's appropriate to each. See? Uh, so... But anyway, that, that's probably not the question you were asking. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the short of it is, no one's numbering them yet. You, you, no, no, no one's being as as rigid as saying there are exactly this number of sacraments. That that comes about much later in the church's history, and 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 largely because we like the number seven. Seven's going to come up uh, even today in in, in Mark. But uh, you know, the, the best argument for why there are seven. The, the medieval Christians like that number. And, and so the, they, they go with seven. There's got to be seven. And now let's come up with a way of defining sacraments so that we can end up with seven. I mean, it really is as, it, it, it's just like that. They did a whole graduate seminar on medieval sacramentology, right? And, and so how, how did the medieval church's understanding of the sacraments come about? How did they come up with this number seven? And for the most part, they themselves write it, saying there must be seven because God loves that number so much. <laughs> I mean, that's the reason, right? It's not like they start with a definition of sacrament and then proceed to find the things that meet that definition. Instead, they start with the number seven and work backwards to come up with the definition that gives you seven. So, uh, which that, that, that doesn't seem the best way to go about it. Okay. And, and as soon as I say that, I look down at my text, and uh, I see the words, they said seven. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what they said. They said seven. Um, okay, so, so we've done Ephrathah. We, we've done the, the fact that uh, uh, all of a sudden he speaks uh, plainly. What, a, what, a, uh, what an amazing thing. And uh, now we move into to chapter 8. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, and they had nothing to eat. We've been here before. He called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they'll faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. I mean, it, it's nice. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the diminutive form of the word for fish. It was, right? If you're an atheologist, you're, you're into fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should uh, should be set before them, and they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full, and there were about four thousand people. And he sent them away, and immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. If I know where Dalmanutha is, no one else does either. <laughs> we, we don't know. This one really is lost, lost us, lost us in history. So, uh, the lost city. That's right. Yeah. Um, this might be interesting and helpful. Let's go back to the feeding of five thousand and see what's similar and what's different. 
so you get the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 6, Mark 6, uh, beginning in uh, verse 30. And so having just heard the account of the 4,000 feeding, well, let's go over the details of the 5,000 feeding. Uh, oh, and, and by the way, let, let's see. Uh, when, it, when it gives you the number, uh, I, I want to... 5,000 men. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah, in verse 9, verse 9 uh, in the Greek, this is 8 verse 9. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's just the word 4,000. You, you get the number word, you don't even have the word people. And, and, and there were hosts about 4,000. Um, Tetra Kiskaboy. How's that? Um... Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Like, like Kiliasm, yeah, Kiliasm, right, is is uh, you know is like the equivalent of millennialism, right? You believe in a literal thousand years from from, from the, the Greek word for thousand, so four thousand would be tetra Kilias. Okay. Um, verse thirty-one, and he said to them, "Come away by yourselves." This is back in, in Mark six. Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. So we we don't have. Uh, that do we in the 4,000, right? There's not an invitation to come to the desolate place. They just end up there because they've been following them around for three days. For many were coming and going, they had no leisure even to eat, and they went in, or they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. Here he had it. He had compassion on them. He had compassion on the 4,000, and it's that very uh, visceral word, right? Like, like, you know, his guts fell out. I mean, that, that, that's literally what the word means. But your your stomach is kind of the equivalent of our, we would say, you, you know, his heart broke for them or something like that. The Greeks would say, you know, his stomach turned. <laughs> we would say our stomach turns when we're disgusted. But, but stomach turning for the Greek is, is a good thing. It's, 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 it's uh, compassion. That's always fun, isn't it? Different cultures and what, what the organs are the seat of, right? Um, but, but the stomach was the seat of, of compassion like that, of, of sympathy. And, and so he has this kind of, you know, he, he sees the need and he, and he can't help but feel sorry for them. He'll feel pity, something like that. Um <laughs> Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. See, that, that, that's not there uh, in the 4,000. And it makes sense, doesn't it, that it wouldn't be there? Because the sheep without a shepherd is primarily a Old Testament God's people image. And what, what group of people is he with with the 4,000? The Gentiles. See, sheep without a shepherd is going to, for a Jewish hearer, harken back to... Uh, you know, Ezekiel, Ezekiel the prophet, right, is going to warn about how, how the sheep have been mistreated by their leaders, their kings, you know, who have not been shepherds to them. And one day, God himself will be their shepherd. But, but sheep there is clearly a word for the people of Israel, not, not, not people in general. Uh, and he began to teach them many things. We don't have that either, except that presumably that's what they've been following him for. You know, not just watching him perform miracles, but also to hear him teach. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, so this is also different. In, in, in the 5,000, the disciples come to Jesus. With the 4,000, Jesus goes to the disciples. This is a desolate place. The hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. I want to point out this difference, too, because this is one of the kind of silly criticisms of the feeding of the, of the 4,000, that there, there are, you know, text critics who want to say, you know, Mark is just, is making this up. He forgot <laughs> <laughs> that, that uh, a few chapters before he wrote about the 5,000. And so, he, you know, he, he forgot exactly how many were there. And he's just telling the story again, right? And, and, and that he's making it up, is one of the arguments that, that's the, adduced for him making it up is the fact that the, the disciples... Could it be this stupid, right? To, to, to have the same, the exact same objection both times, 
right? That that as one takes, you know, that this is psychologically implausible. Okay, but the the objection is not the same in both places. The objection is not the same. What's the objection when he feeds the five thousand in terms of being able to feed them? See, you you really don't. I mean, he says they, they say you know go go into the surrounding countryside and villages and and um, they themselves will buy something to eat and and they said to him shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat see what's really their objection here they can't afford it they can't afford it and in the feeding of the four thousand what's the objection. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's not even a 7-Eleven. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so re reading on with, with 5,000, but, but, but beyond that, I mean, the point is that the 5,000 is the Jewish feeding. The 4,000 is the Gentile one. Right? <laughs> we're, we're having play out exactly what Jesus said to the, or what the Syrophoenician woman said to Jesus, that even the crumbs get to go to the dogs, right? And now they get more than crumbs. They're getting a banquet, a feast, just as the, 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 the Jews did before, the, the Israelites did before. Um, and he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. And I don't think, are we given the numbers? Let's see, we have seven loaves, but we're not even told how many fish, right? A few, few. just a few, yeah. So so five and two, seven and, and a few. Uh, and, and the significance of that, maybe that, that's how many they have. Maybe, maybe that's the, the best thing <laughs> to do, right? But, but we'll talk about the baskets left over. There, there may be significance in that number, especially because Jesus is going to come back to that and say, you not remember how many baskets you had left over? Um, then he commanded them all to sit down in groups. And you, you remember what we said uh, about that word groups? It's, it's, not, it, it's a more technical term than that in the Greek. They're, they're drinking parties. <laughs> no, no, seriously. I mean, he has them sit down in drinking parties, sum, uh, um, uh, symposia, symposia. So a symposium is where you you, you know you, you have a you know it's not just as we think of a symposium you've got people sitting behind a table holding forth on some boring academic topic right symposia originally were times where you got together to talk over things over a lot of a lot of beverages <laughs> right yeah so he, when you read Plato's symposium right what they're saying is being said after a lot of wine <laughs> okay. And, and I, I think that's partly the point, that, that there's some crazy stuff in there. Um, but he divides them into, into drinking groups, eating and drinking groups, you might say, on the green grass. I don't think we get green grass to the 4,000, do we? Uh, but we certainly don't get uh, drinking groups. So they sat down in groups, and now we've got a different word for groups. They sat down in groups, and, and the groups word here is more like... Um, well, we find it in rabbinical literature uh, describing Torah classes, that, that, that when the children in the synagogue were gathered in, in groups to learn the Torah, this is the word used to describe that particular kind of group. Again, makes sense that this word shows up in the Jewish feeding, right? Because it's taking them back to, who do we associate with the Torah? Moses. Charlton, I mean Moses. Moses. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, but we don't get that word in the feeding of the 4,000, the Gentile people. Because it's, it, there's not that Jewish echo of, okay, we've got, a, we've got another Moses here. This is another, you know, the feeding of the 5,000 is like another manna episode where miraculously God directly feeds the people when, when there was otherwise no source of food. Uh, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, this is also interesting, okay? Compare 41 to, in chapter 8, um, uh, verse 6, okay? So 
took the seven loaves in, in chapter 8, took the five loaves in chapter 6 and two fish. He looked up to heaven, chapter 6. Does he look up to heaven in chapter 8? Yeah, he gives thanks. In, in uh, 41, he says a blessing. Okay, with the 5,000 feeding, he says a blessing. With the 4,000 feeding, he gives thanks. It, it's slightly different wording. Uh, broke the loaves and gave them, let's see. Um, having blessed them, uh, no, no. Yeah, he blesses the fish. Yeah, he says, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. That's similar, right? He gives them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And that's almost verbatim the same in both. They all ate and were filled, something like that. Um, and then we get 12 baskets versus 7. So uh, I, I think, oh, 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 this is huge too, okay? Uh, this does not show up in your English translation. The word for basket is different. The word for basket. So... In, in the feeding of the 5,000, the kind of baskets is a, a, a uniquely Jewish term, that, that, that this is a Jewish basket, and um, it even becomes, over time, a kind of pejorative. That is to say, uh, this word for, oh, well, what, what, what might be an equivalent, where, where you want to you wanna make fun of someone for being poor, right? And, and, and you might say, oh, look, look at that guy with his, yeah, I don't know, his, uh, his shopping cart. Okay, <laughs> all right. The shopping cart becomes a symbol of someone in, in, in bad list. financial shape. There you go. Uh, shopping cart, um, yeah, or a bag lady, right? Yeah, think of a bag lady. Okay, some of the, well, Jewish, this, Jewish, this word for basket in chapter 6 is like that, where... where you know, Greeks would, would talk about, you know, a miser and his, and his Jewish basket. Okay? Okay? Uh, the basket in eight is much bigger. Is much bigger. And in fact, it's the exact same word that we see used in Acts chapter 9. Anybody see where I'm headed? What might this basket have been used for? Acts chapter 9. We're up to the story of whom? Conversion of oh, what happened to Saul? Basket case. Yeah, it was a basket case, Ray says. Uh, 925, I believe, is where we see this. Acts 925. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Okay? So it's a big enough for. for Paul would have been, now, maybe that's not saying much, it falls my size, but still, you could put a lot of bread in a, in a, in a basket big enough to, to put a guy in, right? So even though it's only seven versus 12, probably total number of loaves that you have left over is even more with the, with the 4,000 feeding because the, it's a different kind of basket. See, that, all that gets lost because we don't have a, you know, a separate word for basket, but, but it is different in the Greek. It's a different term. And again, all this highlights the fact that we've got two different groups being fed. A Jewish group, and we have all these Jewish and Old Testament images and imagery in the story, and then we've got a whole different vocabulary with, with the, the feeding of the, the Gentiles. Okay? And, and remember, I think this was, you know, we, this would have, would have been one of the last YouTube videos before we were in person again, but that um, it, it's just not settled with the feeding of the 5,000 whether there were more than just the men. I mean, it does say 5,000 men, okay, but that doesn't mean necessarily that that women and children were there as well. And, and, and Matthew uh, d doesn't, d doesn't prove that they were there either. Right, uh, so it could have been just five thousand for them, but that, that's that's probably either here or there. Uh, but here it's just four thousand. Like I said, there's not even not even the word for people, and there were about four thousand. You assume that the word, you know, to 
that that's, that's implied is something like, you, you know, people, humans, whatever, but uh, it's, it's not spelled out. Okay. Um, and, and then he sent them away in, in both feedings. Jesus himself dismisses them, right? Uh, and, and so in, in both places, both 5,000 and 4,000, you've got a picture of what we do at church every day. Every time we have a Lord's Supper service, right? We have the teaching of the word, we have a feeding, and we have Jesus dismissing us, sending us away. Um, all right. What, what else to say about uh, the 4,000 here? Um, it's interesting that the language from both feedings gets collected later in the Lord's Supper account. Uh, so if, if you go to uh, Mark chapter 14 and read how, let's see. Verse um, 22. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, see, notice, see, in the 5,000 he blessed, in the 4,000 he gave thanks, and the Lord's Supper he does both. He gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it into the kingdom of God. Now, I want to say this about the feeding, about both feedings, uh, and how they relate to the Lord's Supper. What, what ultimately is the point of the feeding? What ought the people who experienced that feeding have taken away? I mean, the big takeaway from, I mean, maybe it's clearer in the feeding of the 5,000 because you have all of these echoes of things from the Old Testament, green grass, right? The, 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 the blessing of the bread, eating and being filled. What does that take you back to? Everybody's satisfied with the manna, right? But, but what, what, what's the ultimate point of, of, of the feedings? That's provision for you. Okay, right. Which, why, is this, why should this be remarkable to us? What, what, what's our daily reality? Okay, we can't, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's all God providing. Yeah, God's the source of it, absolutely. And what, what's part of the reality of this broken, fallen world that, that, that makes such a, you know, a feeding with so many leftovers so remarkable? What makes economics possible is the science, Ray. <laughs> Scarcity. Scarcity. I don't know if you know this. We do live in 21st century America. Maybe we don't know this. But elsewhere in the world, there's such a thing called scarcity. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it was like a, it was, you know, Sarah Dalkway uh, was over the other day, and, and I'll just say that. That's being recorded. We kept our distance. We <laughs> wore masks. Uh, she was in one room, and, and, and she used the intercom to communicate oh, yeah. with the rest of us. Um, but, but, but she was saying how it was the first trip to the store with her children. Uh, since both, you know, the COVID stuff started, and and you know Isaac being a three year old can hardly remember <laughs> going to and, and and oh it was Target it was Target and 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 everything he saw right mommy look uh, <laughs> detergent mommy look plates mommy look uh, you know I guess some guys he's a talker <laughs> look mommy an old man <laughs> look mommy a, a grumpy. Uh, <laughs> impertinent old man um, but but see the wonder right we take this for granted you know to see our world through a child's eyes and recognize that this is amazing that we can just go to the store and have whatever we need or want it uh, man you see 
But, but that isn't the reality for the world, for most of world history, because of the brokenness of it all. And here God comes and simply, you know, takes a little, little, a few loaves and a, and, a, and a few fish and makes it to be enough to feed everybody there. And they're, you know, they're not left hungry. You know, they're not, they're, they're, their stomachs aren't rallying anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's amazing. So but what's happened, the, the restored creation that will be at the end of the world, right, is breaking in ahead of time. We're getting a glimpse of it, a preview of it. Do you see that? that? That God is ultimately going to restore things to the original perfect position of that Garden of Eden where everything was just there for the, the having. And, and, and you experience that just a little bit in these miraculous feedings, okay? Now, that, that's the takeaway. That's the takeaway, that we have with us the one who is going to restore creation. See, and, and bring back that original gracious abundance that we have been without ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin. That's, that, that's the direct line, right? The feedings point to the feast at the end of the age, the, the heavenly banquet. But then, it's, they're connected almost, maybe they're like cousins with the Lord's Supper, which also points ahead to the heavenly banquet. And so it's as if we, 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 couldn't, we weren't there. We, we weren't among the, the 5,000 or the 4,000 to experience this miraculous feeding. And yet, God's given us a meal too. It's called the Lord's Supper. And so every Lord's Supper is, as it were, a glimpse, a preview of the heavenly banquet and of that restored abundance that, that God has in store for those who love more. You see that? And, and, and so I, I put it that way because th th you'll read some commentaries who want to say, oh, see, it, it's a direct anticipation of the Lord's Supper. Not quite. You know, you know it's not as if the, the 5,000 diners, you know, that were there and the drinking parties and whatever. It's not like that, that was the Lord's Supper for them. No, it was a participation in a future reality, as it were, right? Which is also what the Lord's Supper is for us. But the Lord's Supper is also Christ's very body and blood, which hasn't been shed yet, hasn't been given yet on the cross at the time of the feeding. So you can't go feeding the 5,000 direct line to Lord's Supper. No, feeding the 5,000 points to heaven. Lord's Supper also points to heaven. And so our Lord's Supper is like our own feeding of the 5,000. Which, by the way, is the only miracle that's in all four Gospels. So we, it, it's, it's obviously very, very important. It, it, it tells us a lot, or else all four evangelists wouldn't have, wouldn't have saw fit to, to include it in the, in the story. Um, only Mark gives us the 4,000. But we see what Mark is, is, is doing is now everything that the Jews got, now the Gentiles are getting. Now the Gentiles are getting. And, and maybe one, one last point about that. And, oh, so some of you all have asked me about this, and, but you're not here. Uh, maybe you'll, you'll get it on, on the video. Um, we can't forget that we Gentiles are blessed by graciously being included among the original true recipients of God's favor, the Jews. It's the Jews first, then the Gentiles, then the Greeks. So the Jews first, and, and we're like the wild oak tree, branches on the wild oak tree that have been cut off and, and grafted onto the, 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 the cultivated oak tree, which is Israel. See, that's our position. Uh, we're, we're in coach. They get first class uh, kind of thing. And, and, and so uh, it, it's... Why it's, are you know, your, your baskets bigger? They're left over baskets. Okay. Uh, and, and seven, and there are seven. I, I think, so you have at the end of the 5,012, 
12, 12 tribes of Israel. So all the promises to Israel are being fulfilled through Christ, see? But now we see just as, oh, 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 oh this is so cool. Go back to the Cyril Phoenician War, okay? And uh, we, we talked about the tone a lot and how we, we, we would love to have a tape recording of this, right? Be able to, to, to play back the, uh, the MP3 of this, uh, but we can't. Uh, so all we have are, are, are the words, and, and we speculate as to, you know, what, what was Christ's body language when he said, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, okay? Um, here's the thing. In, in her response to that, this is verse 28, okay? And, and let, me, let me verify this. This is a point I uh, learned earlier in the week. I may be misremembering it. 28. Yeah, and she answering, uh, and she answered and says, present tense says to him, Lord. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's not there. Okay. Uh, yes, this is correct. So here's what she says. She says, Yes, Lord, there is no word for but. Or, or I mean, do you have yet? Yeah, yeah. Yet. Yeah, yeah. That isn't there. But. That isn't there. Okay, now think about the possibility this creates. Jesus says it's not right to, to take the uh, children, okay, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, and it's the little dogs, right? And throw it to the dogs, cast it to the dogs. Her response back is, is just this. Yes, Lord. The dogs also, right, right, uh, let's see, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, the dogs under the table also eat the children's crumbs. Okay? Now, what, what is that? How, how do we interpret? Well, obviously, the translators, by adding the word yet or but, take the yes, Lord, as her saying what? I agree. It's just as you say. But he's just said, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She could be saying instead, I disagree. Yes, it is right to do that. That's exactly how it works. If you feed the children, you can't not feed the dogs at the same time. Get it? And that's exactly what happens. She understands, even better than the disciples do, apparently, how this works. That if Jesus comes to bring salvation to the Israelites, he can also not bring it to the Gentiles. And that was always, all, all, all from the beginning, baked into the Old Testament promises. Right? That through the offspring of Abraham, who would be blessed? All the nations. All the nations. But it's through the offspring of Abraham. Right? Salvation comes from the Jews, as Jesus says to the woman at the well. Absolutely. And, and, and it's to the Jews first. But... If to the Jews, also then to the Gentiles. And so, yes, yes, Lord, it is right to throw it to the dogs. She's disagreeing. She's disagreeing. Um, anyway, and, and so there you have a plan. Now, the seven baskets, back to Nancy's point. So uh, I, I mentioned that, that one speculation that, that's highly questionable is that seven represents the... Uh, number of known Gentile nations that surrounded Israel at the time, something like that. But, but probably the better way to go is, what, what do we associate with seven? Completion, Completion but, but especially creation of the whole world. So the 12 is a specifically Old Testament people kind of way of talking that, okay, I've, I've fed these 5,000 Jews, but there's plenty left over to feed all of Israel. Everybody. Yeah, and now with the 4,000, I fed just these 4,000 folks, but there's plenty left over to feed the whole world. Yeah, so, so, so seven as whole creation, all of mankind. Um, and, 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 you know, it's, it's going it's gonna to come up again uh, very soon when the disciples are, you know, being, being uh, thick-headed again about what Jesus is trying to teach them. And he'll bring up, do you not remember how many baskets were left over? Uh, when I fed the 5,000. How many baskets were left over when I fed the 4,000? And, and, and it's as if Jesus is saying, 
look, I'm here to restore everything. Right? It's all coming to fulfillment in me. All right, any, any more questions about the, the feeding of the 4,000? Okay, so in verse 10, we get reference to this unknown place, Dalmanutha, but it's uh, likely on the western side of the Sea of Galilee because he's been on the, the eastern side, okay? So, uh, and, and moreover, uh, that, that it's on the western side, and, and, and we're back in Galilee, um, is corroborated by the fact that we've got Pharisees in the next episode. And, and, and we never, the Pharisees and scribes never show up in the Gentile territories. Okay. So the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Who was the first to test Jesus in the Gospel of God? Same thing. It's the exact same word. It's also the word we get in the Lord's Prayer. It is not in two temptation. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. And here's it's the same word that we saw with the healing of the deaf uh, speech impaired man. Remember, he groaned before he um, uh, said everything. Uh, there you might say he, it's kind of a frustration sigh. Uh, here he's, he's, he's really upset with these guys. Uh, he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And that's actually not, we'll, we'll, we'll unpack that too. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the, and this is going to be Gary Larson's favorite verse, the far side. <laughs> Presumably of the lake. Of the Sea of Galilee. So now he's, he's, he's back on the eastern side, and um, uh, we're, we're going to have some more Gentile stuff. But we get this little interlude where he interacts with the Pharisees and all about the sign from heaven. And, and this, I, I, it, it's short, but man, is it critical to Mark's gospel. This is a very, very big deal. We said that at the end of the healing of the deaf speech impaired man, that that represented kind of the height of his popularity, right? And you have the crowds saying, he does all things well. He even makes the deaf hear the mute speak. Now, with this is going to be the final breach with the, the Pharisees and scribes, what he says to them here, what he says to them here. And we see it play out ultimately on the cross. If you go to uh, Mark 15 and look at verse 25, no, no, it's later, it's later. Yeah, yeah, uh, 30, 32, 32. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. See, again, what, what are they demanding? Effectively, a sign. You know, we'll believe in you if you prove it this way. And of course, that isn't going to happen. That isn't going to happen. I mean, and, and so that that doesn't happen is in a sense a fulfillment of what Jesus said. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. Uh, but but let's unpack this a little bit more uh, to better appreciate what, what what's being said here and and, and the whole business of, of seeking the sign and uh, putting that in context. Um, why? Why might Jesus be as upset as he is with them for asking for a sign? Let's start with the question, is it wrong to expect signs from God? No. No. And, and what, 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 are, what are some examples in, in the Bible of, of God giving signs? When he made the fleece wet. And then yeah, Gideon. Up. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. He, he provides Gideon a sign, two signs, right? Uh, to... to Steal him for the battle, kind of thing. What else? The, the, the rainbow, the bow in the sky, is is a sign that, and, and a reminder to God Himself that He's not going to destroy the world by a flood again. What else? He had, had a sign there that led them to where the the child Jesus was. There's even a place in Isaiah. 
Uh, was it 14? Isaiah 14. What's in Isaiah 14? Words. You Hamlet? <laughs> what are you reading, Hamlet? Words. Um, but in Isaiah 14, no, 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 7. Uh, 7, Isaiah 7. Of course, I did. Okay. Um, verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I'll not ask. I'll not put the Lord to the test. See, you know, he, he thinks he's so godly, so pious. God just told you to ask him. And uh, he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And that's where we actually get the virgin birth. In the context of Isaiah coming to the king, Ahaz, saying, God wants you to ask of him a sign. Because see, Ahaz thinks the only way out of his trouble is to make an alliance with Egypt and, and so forth. And God's saying, don't just do something standing there. <laughs> and let, let, let me, right? Uh, and, and God is saying, let me prove to you my trustworthiness. And Ahaz refuses to ask a sign, right? And he, he thinks he's being all spiritual and sanctified and so forth in doing it. And, and if we get the, the wonderful virgin birth, right? What, what greater sign of our Helplessness and in God's uh, power than, 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 than to cause a baby to be born, you know, apart from you know, the act of procreation. So, um, signs themselves aren't a bad thing, right? Or expecting <coughs> a sign from God isn't necessarily a bad thing. Why is it so wrong here? They're tempting Okay, we, we know their motivation, right? Yeah, it, it even tells us that they're testing it. And, and let's talk about the testing. And, and this might help us pray more meaningfully, lead us on into temptation. See, in, in the Greek word for, for temptation is also a word for testing. Latin works the same way, same word. And, and so it can have a kind of neutral meaning, and it can have a negative meaning. So we have in James chapter 1, God tempts no one. Okay, same word, same word. And yet we know God certainly tests us, doesn't he? This is one of his ways of strengthening our faith, is, is putting us in situations where all, all we have is reliance on him. Testing Abraham, for instance. So when it says God indeed tempts no one, you think, well, he certainly tempted Abraham, he certainly tempted Israel. Well, we get a different, you know, like in the dictionary, a, a, a word can have more than one definition, right? So are we operating with definition one or definition two of tempt? God indeed tempts no one. Tempting can also be tempting in the way of Satan tempting Jesus, which is, which is not the neutral tempting. That is to say, when God tests us, he is, as it were, binding us out. Right? When, when you test a chemical, you know, they think of chemistry and, and, and putting different things in the beaker to find out, is this baking soda, is this, you know, whatever. You're, you're tempting it, but in the sense of trying it, testing it. We, we have the word like tentative. You have tentative, right? Uh, uh, everything's been tentative lately, right? We're going to have services in person tentatively, right? Uh, the, 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 the live stream will work when you say tentative. Um, we're, we're, we're trying it out. We're trying to test them. Um, but there, there's another kind, so, so there's, there's that neutral kind of testing, which is a, a, a finding something out. And, and that, that even applies to God testing us to make us stronger in the faith. You know, he, he's, he's putting things that, that sort of prove to us that everything else that we were relying on besides him doesn't cut it, that kind of thing. Um, but then there's the negative kind of tempting test, like, uh, you know, putting a pie in front of a, somebody that's trying to lose some money, right? 
Okay? Where, where you want the person to fail. I mean, that, that's the kind of test Satan is obviously up to with, with Jesus in the wilderness. He's, he's putting things in front of Jesus so as to cause him to stumble. And, and that's the testing that's going on here. It, it's not, they're not, this isn't a, a kind of a impartial curiosity. Let's, let's find out who this Jesus is. So if we ask him this question, depending on his answer, then we'll know whether he's God or not. No, no, no. They're out to get him. They're, they're, they're out to get him with this, with, with this, with this kind of testing. Um, but then, moreover, why then, besides, <laughs> he, he knows their hearts, he knows why they're asking the question, but why, we're in Mark chapter 8, why might Jesus be really put out when the Pharisees ask for a sign? Yeah, how much more does he have to do? It's like John. He's cast out demons. He's, he's raised children from the dead. He's raised people from the dead. He's fed 5,000 with, with uh, just a few fish and a few, few loaves of bread. Right? Now, notice also how they put it. It's not just give us a sign. They demanded what? A sign. From heaven. From heaven. Which implies, what do they think of the stuff he's done up till now? <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's, it's just magic, you know. Anybody could do this, right? The, the Egyptian magicians could have done this stuff, right? It, but it ain't from heaven. Give us a sign from heaven. Now, here's the thing, and what we'll have to we'll have to end here. When, when, when Jesus says, "Why does this generation seek a sign?" We got to talk about well, what, what does that mean? Generation, right? That, and this generation seek a sign. But, but we'll, we'll, we'll pick up with that question next week. I want to talk about. Um, Truly I say to you, oh, that's, there's just so much here. What was the truly word? We don't know what he's saying. We covered this before, truly. Anybody know what the word would be? In, it's, it's Greek, but it's not really. It's, it's actually Hebrew. What, what's, whenever you see truly, or verily in the King James, what's the word behind it, you know? Amen. 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 And, and one of the most remarkable things about Jesus using the word amen, I talked about this in one of the, again, one of the YouTube videos, but maybe it was cut. You know, maybe I said it, and then I played it back, and the upper part of my head was cut off, and so I re recorded and forgot to say it in the second recording. Who knows? Uh, but uh, amen throughout the Old Testament is used as a word of saying, what you've said is true. Right? The, you know, Moses will, will read off the laws, uh, and, and, and then they'll say, we agree, we'll do all that you say. Amen. Amen. So it's saying, you know, this is the truth. We agree with what you say, and we're going to act accordingly. Always is, is how amen shows up. Shows up in the Psalms that way. You know, something will be said of God in praise, and then to doubly reinforce it, amen. Everything I've said about God previously in the Psalm, this is most certainly true. And that's how we're using it when we pray. There's... One exception with Amen in the Old Testament it comes in Isaiah 65. So we're talk talking, you know, fulfillment of all the promises. And it refers to God as the God of Amen. God of Amen. Jesus, when he uses Amen, he uses it not at the end of something, he uses it at the beginning. He says, Amen. And then he proceeds to say the thing that's true. You know, only God can <laughs> amen his own stuff ahead of time. <laughs> right? And you don't find this anywhere else. You do not find elsewhere in the Bible, certainly, but you don't find elsewhere in rabbinical literature or Greek philosophers or anything. No one talks like this. No one goes around saying amen, amen, and then says something. Only Jesus. It's like this is one of the proofs of his divinity, the way he uses amen. He's the God of amen. <laughs> He's the amen that God is God of, right? Uh, so uh, beyond that, obviously it's, it's uh, pay attention to what's about to be said. This is important. Uh, truly I say to you, and he, he doesn't say this. He does not say no sign will be given to this generation 
I'll, I'll take you to, to a parallel in uh, the Old Testament next week, 1 Samuel 14.45, but um, where he says, you, you give, give me the verse number again. This is Mark 8, what, what, what? Uh, 12, yes, 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 yes. Here's all it says. Uh, Amen, I say to you, if... Um, if is given to this generation a sign, that's it. Okay? Now what's going on there? That is a very Hebraic way of putting um, a, a God forbid statement. Okay? And this is a Hebrew way. You, would, you, would, you, you, you set it off. The, the thing that, that is not going to happen, you say, if such and such, right? And then dot, dot, dot. You, you don't you don't fill in the the because because the filling in is something like God curse me uh, I'll die or may God punish me something like that you know if, if such and such were to happen may, may God strike me down that, that that's the implication and and that's that's the construction here if a sign is given to this generation may I be cursed that that that's the force of it. You see, and so he ain't giving them a sign. Uh, they 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 run out of God's patience now, and and so no sign is going to be given to them. And he'll continue to work with the disciples and the Gentiles a little bit. He's about to get fed up with the disciples too, um, but but uh, enough enough. How dare you not think the signs I've done so far are not from heaven, right? And and so there there is no sign. Uh, and, and if, if there's a sign, it's the counter sign, which is that he doesn't come down from the cross. See, uh, but anyway, okay, much more can be uh, said about this. I want to get this straight because it really sets the stage for Mark's particular emphasis on the crucifixion. Let's close in prayer. Crucifixion. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that you have opened our ears and our hearts to your gracious word and that you have made us participants in your kingdom uh, through your son Jesus. Uh, help us uh, each and every day reflect the love that you have for us by the way that we love the people that you put in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.